So let me ask you a question. So how many of you tell me you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Okay. Okay, most of you. How many of you have ever laid hands on someone to get filled with the Holy Spirit? Okay, not yet. Okay, so, okay, so, well, so the funny thing was I was raised in a Baptist church and uh, at time because I could pray, you know, in English for about an hour, but I felt like I ran out of things to pray for, but yet I felt like, man, there's still something I need to, I still want to pray and I just don't get it. He said, oh, well, you just need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No explanation, nothing. Went to his church, never saw anything like it in my life. Got filled with the Holy Spirit. I thought, wow, this is amazing. Went back to the BYF, Baptist Youth Fellowship, laid hands on everybody. They got filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke in other tongues. Then, then, lo and behold, got a call from the pastor. Never got a call from him before. Found out they don't believe in that. <laughs> that that's from the devil. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so, so the funny thing is, so that really made me learn and know what I believe in this. I think we who are filled with the Holy Spirit, first of all, we're very bad at explaining it, and we're very bad at leading people into the Holy Spirit. And so what I want to do is I want to share with what I share all around the world. Um, and so that is probably, uh, of all the things, we, we've, you know, we've gone all around the world, we've lived around the world, we have prayed for thousands of people to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we stopped counting 30 years ago at 10,000. We just, we just stopped. But we would go to villages, and literally my wife would start on one side, and I'd be on the other, hand, other side, and we would pray. And, and we, uh, we, I went to Africa a couple months ago, prayed for 400, uh, went to a, a high school, uh, got them all filled with the Holy Spirit. So, but we do a very bad job of explaining. And here's the issue. In Galatians 1, it says that, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? By the hearing of faith. For people to have faith to receive the Holy Spirit, they have to have faith. Faith is always based on hearing the word. So we don't present the word well. But the, there's another thing to it. In, in 1 Corinthians 12, the, the very last verse, in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, it says the same thing. Earnestly desire. King James says, lust after the best gifts. I find that most people and most people who are filled with the Holy Spirit never pray in tongues because they really don't understand how, how this could be a weapon, how I can use it more effectively. So I find... The, the number one key to getting people filled with the Holy Spirit is get them so hungry for praying in tongues that they'll, anel, anel, they'll uh, anel, long for, for it. They'll desire it. They'll lust earnestly for it. Amen? And so we need the Holy Spirit. So, so Father, I, I ask that you would anoint our ears to hear, but that we would understand how in the coming revival where a billion souls are coming to Christ and where you are pouring out your Spirit on all flesh, how you would use each one of us for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Joel 2.28, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants and my handmaidens, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. We are living in those days. God wants to pour out his spirit. So when I talk to people who, uh, so in our church, we have people that have been raised differently, you know, different denominations, and <clears throat> they've never heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, one of my greatest joys in life is to feel Baptist with the Holy Spirit, and we got a couple Baptists filled a couple months ago in our church. But so what's, uh, what's, uh, but what's, what they don't realize is in the church world, in, in the world, there are two billion people that say they're Christians. 51% of them are baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. What, it, what, is, what is that telling me? That the, of, of the church, the people who say that they are the church, it is the greatest movement within the church. Among the Catholics, they estimate that 400 million Catholics were spirit-filled. Huge movement in the Episcopal church. Huge movement in the Lutheran church uh, um, uh, of the Holy Spirit. The 80s, the 90s. I worked with, uh, there was a guy called Mr. Pentecost who was instrumental in bringing the Holy Spirit to the Catholic Church. 400 million Catholic. Of course, they, you know, if, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's hard to stay in a church where you don't get fed. Am I right? So said a lot of them migrated. But uh, we need the Holy Spirit and we need to know, we know, we need to know how to present it, okay? So, the one thing that we need to know, the last words of Jesus in Acts chapter 1, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. 
Don't leave Jerusalem. It's like the, that, uh, the American Express. Don't leave home without it. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. So we need that power. Most of us don't walk in that power, and I'm going to talk about that a little on, but my goal here is to sh share with you how to share with someone else so that it will be easy for them to receive. And some of you still don't have your prayer language. You need it today. And, and I'm going to give you some uh, reasons why you need to pray in tongues. So in the Bible, being filled with the Holy Spirit and being baptized by the Holy Spirit is the same thing. They, they use them synonymously. The word baptism in the Greek is, 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 the, is the... Actually, the word baptism in English is from the Greek word baptizo. Yeah. And you may not realize this, but when they were translating the King James Bible into English... Uh, the reason they transliterated it letter for letter from the Greek instead of translating it dunk or immerse was because at that time the English church didn't baptize by immersion. And they say, if we translate it, we'll get our heads cut off. So we're going to coin a new word and we're going to call it baptism. And then the priest can say whatever they want to about it. They can explain it. But, but when you see the word baptism, all it means, it's the Greek word for immerse, to dunk, to completely fill. Okay? So, uh, so... Many people, when they receive Christ, they ask the question, well, don't I already have the Holy Spirit? So let me ask a different question. Did Jesus have the Holy Spirit with him all his life? See, he was, him and Adam and Eve were the only three people that were born saved. Am I right? Of course, there was a fourth one. I went to Bible college. Our first, I'll never forget, my first, my first day in Bible college, we're at the lunch table, and we're just going around telling our story. And this one pastor son said, well, I've always been a Christian. My dad's a pastor. No, you're not born again. <laughs> Am I right? And I, I have this, uh, we, you know, when we go around in our small groups, from time to time, we'll get someone in our small groups. I've always been a Christian. Gong, that's the wrong answer. You've not always been a Christian. You were born <laughs> a sinner, right? But Jesus was born. The only other person after Adam and Eve that was born was salvation already in the spirit. But now we see a curious thing in Luke chapter 3, verse 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love with you. I'm well pleased. Luke 4, 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. So I want you to catch something here. <clears throat> Jesus has saved all his life, but it was only when he was baptized in the river Jordan that the Holy Spirit came on him. There is a distinction. Yes. He still needed to be baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit. And before he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he didn't do one miracle. If you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament is so explicit. The Holy Spirit came upon. The Holy Spirit came upon Samson. He was filled with amazing strength. The Holy Spirit came upon David. You know, the Holy Spirit came upon Saul. But it's always upon. So when we get filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is on us for others. But God, in the Old Testament, he talked about a different way the Holy Spirit was going to come on us. He said, I want to put my spirit in you. So when we're born again, he puts his spirit in us, but we still need him on us for other people. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, so what takes place, the Bible says that when we receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into our spirit, becomes one with us. 1 Corinthians six seventeen says, he who unites himself with the Lord is one spirit with him. I love this. Salvation is amazing. Everything in Jesus flows into us. That's how we get eternal life. We don't have eternal life, but he does. When we receive Christ, right in us. Joy, peace, everything in Jesus comes in us. That's, that's, that's called the great exchange. He gets very little from it. We get everything from it. You know what I'm saying? So in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, 13, it says we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Don't mistake this. He is talking about salvation. Whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. We were immersed by one spirit into one body. He's talking about Christ. When you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit grabbed you and immersed you into Christ and you became one with him. Yeah. Now I want you to catch, who's the agent here? The Holy Spirit. 
when we say that, we, when we say the sinner's prayer, when we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, the Holy Spirit grabs us, immerses us into Christ. Uh, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is different because in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, because we're now in him, he takes us and immerses us in the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? Luke three sixteen. John answered them, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming more powerful than I, uh, whose th throngs of the sandals I'm not worthy to, to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so, so there's a difference here. So there's a distinction. Why I'm saying this? Because half the Christian world believes they got everything when they got saved. But in the Bible, no one ever got filled with the Holy Spirit and saved at the same time other than maybe Cornelius in his house. So God helps us by giving us pictures to understand the difference. In John chapter 4, Jesus said that when we receive Christ, it's like having a well inside us. John 4, 14, the water I give him will become in him a well of water, springing up to eternal life. How many of you have a well at your house? Do we have any farmers out there? Where, where are you all at? Indiana? Indiana. <laughs> you're, out in the, you're out in the country? Yes. yes, well water. How many of you are ever raised on well water? That, so, so if you're a city folk, you may not know this, wells have limits. Times of drought, they can run dry. So when I met my wife, because I, I don't always get the story right, but she lived in a neighborhood in Guatemala that they had one well for their neighborhood. And when they only, it was only touching 100 homes, everybody had water all the time. But you know, in Central America, they started attaching more pipes before you know it. They had like, a, a, I mean, four or five neighborhoods. When I got there, they had wa water once a week, like from midnight to six in the morning, something like that. Once a week, six hours, they had to ration it because wells are limited. So when you receive Christ, what is this well? Well, I drink from it every day. It's a benefit for me. Am I right? That's what salvation is. I drink from it every day. But God wants to give us more power because to make it in this world, to live a, a godly life, to live above sin, to make an impact in our community, in our world, he wants to change the well into a river. Amen. Now, Jesus cried on the last day, John 7, 37, on the great day of the feast. He cried out and said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. As the Spirit says, as the Scripture says, he who believes in me from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. I tell people, you're born again. Oh, he wants to change that well into a river because a river touches everybody. Have you ever seen the Mississippi, the Ohio River? You know that, oh, that rivers, the Thames, you see that the rivers, they touch thousands of people. Unlimited, unlimited resources. So in the New Testament, every case, we see that salvation is distinct from the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The first one's Jesus. He was born saved, but yet he needed the filling of the Holy Spirit at the River Jordan. The disciples, here's another great example, John chapter 20. Jesus had just risen from the dead. It is the same day he rose from the dead. Notice what it says. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace with you, peace be with you. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. With that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That was salvation because before his, before his death and resurrection, their faith in him had no ability to legally bring salvation. But now that he is the risen Lord, he paid for their sins. When he breathed on them, salvation was imparted. How do I know that? Because he said just a few weeks later, hey guys, you still need something. In just a few days, you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But I thought we had the Holy Spirit. Oh no, you got him in there, but you need him on you now. You need an, a, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. City of Samaria is another great example. Ch Acts chapter 8, Philip went down to a city in Samaria. Watch this, because I'm going to ask you questions. And he proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Let me ask a quick question. Are they saved at this point? They believed and were baptized. They are saved. Salvation imparted. Okay, moving down. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not come yet on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord. Interesting. 
Here we see a, a distinction between salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We see another one, a fourth example in the city of Ephesus, Acts chapter 19. Paul comes and sees some believers and he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? If there was only one experience, he never would have asked that question. Yes, but there is a separate experience. Once you're born again, there is an experience called being filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, we haven't even heard about it. How do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? Let's go back to Acts chapter 2, verse, verse 2. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So we see two things happen. The first one is the Holy Spirit came on them. Am I right? Came on them. And what else did they do? And they spoke in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So this is something we have to talk about. We do. Because people say, well, pastor, I've heard that tongues have been done away with. What do you say? Well, the Bible actually says two things. In Acts chapter 2, when they were first filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter goes out on the street and he talks about what they were, they thought they were drunk. No, no, you're not dr we're not drunk like you think. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he goes, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. To this day, God is still calling and filling people with the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about a time where there will be no spiritual gifts, where spiritual gifts will be done away with. Prophecies, tongues, all that stuff. However, it's clear, clearly referring to heaven, when we are in heaven, when the Bible says when we see Jesus face to face. See, we're not going to need spiritual gifts. Am I right? We're going to have new bodies. We're not going to need healing. Am I right? We're, we're, we're gonna, our needs will be different. Let me tell you one of the reasons, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, but in Romans 8, 26, it says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. In, in context, he's talking about spiritual gifts. When we are weak in our flesh, he enables us through spiritual gifts. In heaven, we're not going to have weaknesses. Am I right? We're not going to just know in part we're going to, we won't need to prophesy. We won't, have, we won't need healing because we'll see God face to face. We'll live in a place where God's will is always done. Spiritual gifts are, are given to us now to help us in our weakness. I'm going to tell you the two weaknesses he's referring to. We don't know everything, and we don't have all power. So we need, we need, we need God to show up, okay? But let me give you another point. So in the Bible, every time the Holy Spirit was received, they spoke in tongues. So speaking in tongues is the main evidence that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Acts 10.44, while P Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. How did they know? For they heard them. For they heard them. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Acts 19, in Ephesus, Paul placed his hands on them. The Holy Spirit came on them. They spoke in tongues and prophesied. So here's the big deal. Why in the world would I want to speak in a language I don't understand? Am I right? <laughs> we need to talk about that because we don't know how to explain it really well. But the truth, and first of all, we have to understand that when we speak in tongues, Speaking in tongues is a prayer language to God. 1 Corinthians 14, 12, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. It's a prayer language. 1 Corinthians 14, 14, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. In fact, you'll find that the Apostle Paul says that when we're praying in tongues, we're praying in or with the Spirit of God. So we see this even in Ephesians. He talks about we need to pray in the Spirit. We see it in Jude 20, beloved, build up, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, faith praying in the Holy Spirit. So those, those, those scriptures, God he talks about it in other ways. He doesn't just use it by tongues, but it's because you're praying in the Spirit, okay? So, and Paul says this. Here's his conclusion in 1 Corinthians 14. What's the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. What's he talking about? Praying in tongues. Let me give you four amazing benefits to praying in tongues. And we need to pump up the benefits because when people get the benefits, their mouths are watering for the Holy Spirit. 
really is. Let me give you the first benefit of praying in tongues. Praying in tongues builds you up. 1 Corinthians 14, 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Or as I just said in Jude 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Building yourselves up edifies, build yourself up. In a culture uh, uh, in which 60% of our culture is depressed, do you think a little edification and building up might be helpful? Do you think that might help us not rely on drugs to get out of depression? It might. I know, I know how it is with me. Now, I'm the most optimistic guy on the planet. I am up 363 days of the year. There's two days a year that I'm down, but that's, and that's rare. And usually my wife kicks me when I'm, I'm down. But she, no, no, she, she actually encourages me. You know, my wife is a great encourager, I have to admit, but it's rare that I'm down. But th- when I'm down and I'm empty, when I feel like I've gotten the snot beat out of me, I don't know if anybody ever feels like that ever. I begin to pray in tongues because when I pray in tongues, it fills me with the Holy Spirit. My depression goes into optimism. I feel like I can do anything. So praying in tongues builds you up. We need build up from time to time. Am I right? Some of you need build up today. The second benefit, praying in tongues fills you up with the Holy Spirit. I love Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, where Paul says, don't be drunk with wine because that'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit speaking to one another. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Greek there, since I see a lot of Greek scholars here, I think people doing the Greek, it's actually there, uh, the present continuous tense. It really means be being filled. Be being filled. Because I know so many, I call them the old fart Christians. They're, they, they've been <laughs> sucking lemons all day. They're so... There's a somberness. There's a sadness to them. There's no joy in them. They're not full of the Holy Spirit. No, I don't know. They're full of, well, I can't say that. But my, gran- my grandfather used to say piss and vinegar. Okay, but I'll let him say that. How many of you know people like that? Okay. So, so yeah. So, but let me say something here. Why do I need to be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit? How many of you came here in a vehicle? No one brought their horse? No one? Okay, so all cars. How many of you know that once you drive it, you have to fill it up with something? Let me tell you why we need to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you the truth. We leak. We leak. See, today, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, or even if you think you are, I'm going to lay hands on you, and you're going to be as full as this, this uh, little thing here. But as soon as you, you know exactly what's going to happen. You go out there, and someone's going to cut you off, and oop, there goes some of that filling. Then you go home and your spouse starts ragging on you, right? And then you find out that while you were gone, your dogs had just pooped on your bed. And now it's a Sunday, and guess what? Someone took your donut, the donut that you wanted at church. We have donuts at church. If you don't have donuts at your church, it's not my fault. Okay? And then Monday, you go to work, and guess what? You're on 395. That's all you need. And I'm telling you, by the end of a day or two, you are empty. You are empty. And I find holy Christians unfilled with the Holy Spirit most of their lives. So they tell me when they're filled with the Holy Spirit, no, you're not full of, you're not full of him. You're full of your flesh. You're full of everything else. See, I brought a towel, by the way, if you can't see this, because we just painted this. I don't want that's her good towel. I didn't tell her I was doing this. Yes, that's it. Okay. Yes. Don't worry, I'm going to be praying in tongues today. There we go. Okay. But anyway, so, so we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We really do. Let me give you a third benefit. Uh, praying in tongues is God's way to answer our prayer when we don't know how to pray. Yeah. Romans 8, 26, in the same way the Holy Spirit helps our weakness. We don't know how we ought to pray. My daughter is in Australia. From time to time, she's going to hill songs. I don't know how to pray for her, but I sense there's something wrong. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You feel like your, your, your wife's somewhere in uh, Tennessee, right? Yeah, yeah. How many of we, we had a heaviness come over us and we, uh, a, a person in our life has come before our face? Yeah. How do I pray for them? I don't know, but the Holy Spirit does. So I can say, Holy Spirit, pray through me for this person. Let me tell you why this is so good. It says we don't know how we ought to pray, but the Holy Spirit intercedes through us or for us with groans that can't, words can't express. He's talking about praying in tongues. Let me tell you the secret to answered prayer. And we see it in 1 John 5. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
Most of the time, if we have a scripture and a promise, we pray in English and we pray in faith, right? So many times we don't know the will of God. God, is this the business you want me to get into? Is, is this the person I'm supposed to marry? Is this the job I'm supposed to get to? I don't know how to pray for this. Holy Spirit, pray through me. Yes. Yeah. So many times we don't know how to pray. And I can just say, Holy Spirit, pray through me. And when I begin to pray in tongues at those points, I feel a heaviness, a burden right here. Yeah, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You felt that before when you're praying. The key to answered prayer is praying according to God's will. Let me share a couple of examples from my life. Now, now if you've ever read Kenneth Hagin, his, his story inspired me when I was a teenager. He was, shares the story of a man. He was called to the hospital. His son had been in, in a motorcycle accident. His spine was broken in four places. He was what we'd call brain dead today. It was in the 50s that they didn't use that term. The doctors looked at the, the father and said, and he was a pastor. He said, you know, it's better if he dies. Because if he, he lives, he'll be a vegetable. And he, his spine is broken, he'll be a paraplegic vegetable. Can you imagine something like that happened to you? So the man didn't know what to do, so he shut the door and, and he prayed. He, he said, Holy Spirit, I don't want to pray. And he prayed in tongues all night. All night. In the morning, he felt a hand on his shoulder. He thought it was the nurse, but it was his son. He said, Dad, the Lord's healed me. He stood up from the bed walked out of the hospital. That inspired me because a year later, my sister came home. Baptist family, we go to church three times a week. We love, quote, love the Lord in our Baptisty way. But I'm just saying, she comes home and she says, this is the last day you're ever going to see me because I'm eloping with so-and-so and I'm going to Texas. You'll never see me again. Inwardly, I'm thinking, <laughs> didn't like her anyway. Yeah, no. How many of you ever had a sister you were antagonistic to? Yeah, anyway, but that, that was her. But my dad said, oh, no, you're not, you blankety-blankety-blankety-blank, blankety, 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 because I'm going to go up to my room, and I'm going to get my blankety-blank gun, I'm going to blow your brains out, and I'm going to blow his brains out. So she runs down the steps to her car. He runs up to the bedroom to get his shotgun. He runs down, gets, she zooms off. He zooms off in his truck with his shotgun, and both of them leave just like that. I said, Holy Spirit, I don't know how to pray as I ought to. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I said, I mean, I'm, here I am. I mean, we've never had something like, I mean, we have never had anything like this happen in our house. And so I said, Holy Spirit, pray through me. And I began to pray in tongues. And I want you to know I prayed, got in my room, I prayed all evening, I prayed all night. There was a strength, an anointing to pray. I heard doors open and shut during the night. When I woke up the next morning, it was as if God took a big eraser and erased the day before. My sister was there, never left. My dad was there, never mentioned it. I said, God, I don't know what you've done, but whew, we are grateful. I am grateful. To this day, my house was preserved because the Holy Spirit prayed through me. Fast forward 20, 30 years when we were in Russia, we had planted many churches throughout the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had fell. We were living in a, uh, the Baltic Republics in Latvia, and they, they wanted to get rid of every missionary there was. In fact, everybody had been thrown out of the country. We were the last ones standing. We went to get our visas uh, renewed. And the guy, I, I, I went to the guy who was the head of immigration. He cussed me out in Russian, told me I would never come back in his country again, ever. They, he stamped my passport with a, a three-day extradition order for me, my wife, all my kids. And our dog. Well, <laughs> he didn't have a passport, but I'm sure he would have gone three days in jail. When I came home from immigration, I said to my wife, we're not going to sleep tonight because if we sleep, we're, we're, we're going to be kicked out of this place. And we, it was probably the hardest thing we ever did. We prayed in tongues together all evening, all, after, all afternoon, all evening, all night. It was hard. We had to keep elbowing each other to stay awake. I said to God, I said, I'm not moving until you move. About 10 o'clock the next morning, a knock on the door, and a Russian guy came, and he said, he, this, these were exact words in Russian, a door has been opened, a way has been found. Wow. A general, a Russian general, was going to speak for us and give me my, 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 my I got a, the same guy who cussed me out three days before, gave me a residency visa, the same guy, praying in tongues. 
we don't use it enough. We don't use it enough. When we don't know how to pray, he prays through us. Let me give you a fourth benefit. When we pray in tongues, God shows us the mysteries of our future. I want to talk about this just for a second because we're about to pray, so just hold on. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says it like this. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, when I was a Baptist, they said, oh, this is talking about heaven. It's not talking about heaven. Look at the very next scripture. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. You need to understand that God has planned amazing things. The desires, the dreams in your heart. I believe that 99% of God's dreams for our life, which are much better than our dreams, never come to fruition. Never come to fruition because they're revealed by the Spirit. There's timing, there's strategies involved. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the man's spirit within him in the same way? No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What's Paul saying here? God's Spirit knows all the things that we need to know. So notice what it goes on to say. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. What God has freely given us. What God has freely given us. That's, that's past tense. He's already, in the Spirit, it's already given to us. We never walk in it because we never spend time praying in tongues. I'll tell you, we, we were going through a hard time in our church financially. We were on the other side of the street. They raised our rent $4,000 a month more. And then they said, so at the end of every year, they, so they had little extras, like if they do snow remove, and they take out every month. They were taking $2,000 a month out for those kind of things. But at the end of the year, they said, oh, you're a little short. I said, how much? Short? We need a 50 more thousand dollars from you. In one shot. Yeah, they were trying to get rid of us. They were lying to us. They didn't need 50,000. They wanted to get rid of us. But anyway, so what's interesting, so we began to pray. I began to pray in tongues. I was going crazy. And I said, I said, Holy Spirit, I need, a, I need something. I need money. I need some divine. In. And the Holy Spirit said, the answer is on its way. Two days later, I get a phone call. Hey, we're a church. We just started. We'd love to rent your building on Saturdays. Uh, Saturdays and Sunday afternoons will give you 4000 a month. What do you think? I said, sounds great. <laughs> sounds great. One time I was praying in tongues. I, I, I walk in the four. I don't know about you, so here's the issue with praying in tongues. When you pray in tongues, first of all, let's be honest, the first 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes, your mind's fighting you. Boy, you're wasting your time. Boy, this is so boring. And then you're analyzing. Did I say that syllable three times in a row? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, when I was in, when I was in Bible college, my, my roommate had an, a language that sounded like he was underwater when he was praying in tongues. I can never in my life imitate him on that one. But anyway, so we do all kinds of crazy things Be, because you're mine. So here's the deal. It, I didn't put it here, but it's also the best way to hear the voice of God because how many of you remember what old TVs used to look like? They had volume buttons. Volume buttons you had to turn on all the way on. So here's the deal. We've got two volume buttons. We've got one right here. We've got one right here. Here's our spirit. Here's our mind. The voice of our mind's on 10. The voice of our spirit's on zero. God's talking to us all the time. We don't hear anything. But when I pray in tongues, I fill myself with the Holy Spirit. And it starts turning up right here. And then my mind is so bored. The Bible says when I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. My mind doesn't understand the word of it. What happens? It gets quieter and quieter and quieter. Do you know why I walk in when I pray? Because after about two or three hours when my mind is completely quiet, I will fall asleep if I'm sitting down or lying down. Am I right? Or on my knees. I will, indeed. But God wants to talk to you about your future. I remember one time I was walking in the forest, and I heard the Lord say, in 10 days, you're going to receive an unusually large gift, and here's what I want you to do with it. He gave me three things to do with it. I said, that's odd. <laughs> but we're praying our future. Futures sometimes never happen because we never pray them through in the Spirit. Ten days later, that evening, ten days in the evening, ten days later in the evening, a woman called and said, I want to give you $40,000. Wow. Yeah. You might have more coming. You never know. I'm just saying. But that's why God tells us we need both forms of prayer. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, what shall I do? I'll pray with my spirit. I'll pray with my mind. I'll sing with my spirit. I'll sing with my mind. 
when we pray, when we talk to people about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we give them the scriptural foundation like I did, but then we talk about the benefits of praying in tongues. People want, when they, when, I'm serious, when you talk about the benefits of praying in tongues, people love it because they want it. They want that power in their life. We need that power in our life. We need more of him and less of us. And that's what happens when I pray in tongues. Amen. How do I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Let me explain this because we're terrible at explaining things. Sometimes God just does it, right? Sometimes if you fast and pray, let me just be honest, if you fast and pray three, four, five days, there will be such a strong anointing, anybody would speak, even a dog would speak in tongues, seriously, <laughs> when you lay hands on them. But most of the time we don't walk in that strong anointing, so the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak as the Holy Spirit enabled them. I want you to catch this. So you have to be born again first. That's the first step. Second step, every time in the Bible, except for, for the day of Pentecost and Cornelius, they laid hands on them. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have the authority to lay your hands on somebody and the Spirit on you will go on them. When I pray for someone and I say receive the Holy Spirit, I can feel some go right into them. So I know they received it. They don't always pray in tongues because there's a battle in their mind. There's a battle in their mind. But um, so what, what, when you lay hands on them, all you have to tell them, here's the, here's the only thing I want you to say. Father, I receive the Holy Spirit. That's it. Father, I receive the Holy Spirit. Whew, instantly he goes in. Instantly he goes into them. From that moment on, they have the ability to pray in tongues. They, they do. It's just that, it's that simple. And then I always tell them, after that, no more English. Open your mouth and begin to pray in the unknown tongue. And so I, I explain a few things. Remember, this is the first time in your life that you're speaking from your spirit, man. Most of the time when we talk, it comes straight from our mind right through our mouth. But now we're praying in tongues. It goes from our spirit right to our, through our mouth, and this one doesn't understand it. Sometimes we have unrealistic expectations. We think God's going to grab our mouth and make our jaws move up and down our tongue and will the air come out all by himself? No. <laughs> they were filled. They began to speak. You will find that every gift of the Spirit and everything that God does is 50-50. He gives the anointing, the unction, the gift. We have to open our mouth. We have to use our own lungs. We have to move our own lips. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it is, is indeed. So God's not going to force you. Let me say a third thing. Your mind will never understand what you're saying unless God gives you an interpretation. And so your mind will always tell you you're just making it up. I don't understand this. This is a waste of time. Your mind will always tell you that. Your mind is overrated, okay? I'm just saying, it's overrated. Um, how do I know this is from God then? Well, there's two, there's two pruebas. There's two proofs. There's two proofs. After a few minutes of praying in tongues, oh, you feel a peace that you didn't have before. Peace. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Oh, yeah. Your mind screaming, what are you doing? But there's a peace here. You can't figure it out. Mm. Sometimes when we lay hands on people, they, they can feel even fire. It doesn't matter what they feel. They receive by faith. Father, receive the Holy Spirit. Boom. He goes in them. Now they have to open their mouth and in faith start speaking. But Jesus gave all of us a promise. Luke eleven thirteen, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen. This is your promise from God that you're not going to receive something from the devil, not something weird, but just the Holy Spirit, okay? So when we lay hands on you, you just say, Father, receive the Holy Spirit, then open your mouth and begin speaking that other tongue. As you speak, it will, it will more words will come, Okay? And then after you begin speaking, for, I always have them speak, pray in tongues for five, ten minutes to, to, until it flows well and, and they can sense, sense that, that peace. But then I tell them, go home and spend 20, 30 minutes every day praying in tongues because what happens is everything that God gives us that we receive by faith, we can lose through unbelief. How many of you remember when you were first saved? After about a day or so, you thought, well, am I really saved? Because I don't feel like I felt like yesterday. You know, and he tries to say, Satan always tries to steal what God gives us. So, there, so, yes, you feel the wonderful, you feel the fire, you feel the peace, whatever. You're praying in tongues. Then you get home tonight, you begin to pray, and the thought comes with it. This isn't God. How could this be God? If he can, and, and most Christians never pray in tongues because they're, they're tormented by the enemy. You have to make yourself pray in tongues 30, 40 minutes every day for a good week until you break the unbelief. And so what happens is my dumb, dumb brain here, it never understands what I'm saying, but it, we've come to a, a, a happy medium where it, it doesn't know what I'm saying, 
But it knows that when I do it, I sense something in me that's wonderful and powerful. You know what I'm saying? I, I sense a difference in me. Um, and once, let me just say this. After a while, after you know that it's God, Satan changes his tactics and makes you so busy, so uninterested, you never pray in tongues. And that's who I'm talking to today. <laughs> no, am I right? Yeah. So I also want to say I challenge everybody when they get filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, it's amazing how we can watch TV. We can just binge eight hours. I always challenge people after they get filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, and after about a week of praying in tongues for 30 minutes that they got it down, find them a, a Saturday or a day off where they can spend three or four hours praying in tongues. And I'll tell you why. Because something happens after about, th to me it takes three and a half hours because you may be a little more holy than mine. It takes about three and a half hours for my mind to shut up. So it takes about three and a half hours for my mind to go on zero, my spirit to be full. And when that, take, when that takes place, this is where the Bible says they were in the spirit. The book of Revelation started because I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. How did he get in the spirit? Hey, like Paul told Timothy, stir up that gift. Pray in tongues. You need to do something, right? He was in the spirit. So many things happened in the Bible when they were in the spirit. When Paul was in, that, in the boat in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea in the middle of a hurricane, what do you think he was doing down in the Holy Spirit? He was praying in tongues. He was crying out to God. It was, yeah, because he needed to hear from God. You need to hear from God today. You need to pray in tongues. You really do. Um, but you come to a point where your mind is quiet, and then this is when I just, I still my voice, and I say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. And the thoughts of God come to me. I write them down, and I can hear God's voice so clear. People tell me, I don't know how to hear the voice of God. Pray in tongues three or four hours. You won't hear your mind anymore. Your mind will be gone by then. And then psh, it'll be God just coming right out of you. You'd be surprised at what God will speak to you about. He'll speak to about how you treat your wife, how you treat your husband. He'll t tell you things about your children are going through things that they're going to go through. Things about your families. Things about your finances. Because God is a great father. He's interested in you and the things that touch our minds and our hearts. So, so he will talk to you about those things. But so, so that's my challenge to you. So we want to pray right now. We want to, we want to release the Holy Spirit. Some of you, uh, maybe not full of the Holy Spirit. Now let's all stand for right now. If you, if you can't pray in tongues, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, some of you who haven't prayed in tongues in gazillions of years, you're not full of the Holy Spirit either. But I mean, you're, you're fooling yourself, right? And so, but we want to pray. So just, just come forward. We're going to lay hands on you. We're going to lay hands on you. There's an anointing here. Anybody who wants to receive the Holy Spirit, they want, you, want, you, you want to get filled with the Holy Spirit, it's just that simple. Come on, I am going to, see, you know, so I'm going to share something. You know, I went to a town, I went to a town in Guatemala. It was a Pentecostal church, Church of God, Church of God Holiness. So 100 people, and when I go to Pentecostal churches in Central America, I know that less than half of them are really filled with the Holy Spirit. I call them the noisy churches. They've got lots of noise, but no power. So I preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and no one came forward. And, I, and I, uh, I thought, am I in the wrong place? I mean, could it possibly be that I have finally come to a church that is full of people that are absolute, absolutely filled with the Holy Spirit? So I looked at the first person in the first row and I said, can you speak in tongues? No. Jerked him up with my arm. I looked at the guy next to him. Can you speak in tongues? No. Jerked him up. I jerked up the first row and then everybody realized I was going to jerk them up. The whole church came forward, including the pastor. None of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were just noisy. Just saying. It happens. Amen. So this is a great time. This is a great time. Come on, let's begin to pray in, in tongues quietly. Yes. So simple. It's so simple. So simple. So there's a breakthrough coming for you today. When we lay hands on you, when we lay hands on you, I want you to say just one thing. Father, receive the Holy Spirit. And then just open your mouth and begin to pray in the unknown tongue. Okay? Put your mind to one side. You'll feel peace in a few minutes. But there's an anointing. There's a strong anointing. Tell you.